Hi, we're back for the next sermon in our series on Luke. Uh, let's read the passage. It's Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through to 31, and then uh, we'll pray. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. He said to them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Let's pray, shall we? Loving Lord God, what does it take to convince someone? Uh, Lord, we uh, pray that you would convince us with your word this morning. We pray that your word would work powerfully within us, that we would see what is truly there, not read in our own understanding, but rather see what you have set down for us to understand and treat it with all seriousness, Lord, for these are matters of life and death. Lord, uh, uh, please help us in this endeavour then by the power of your Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus gives us two representatives of humankind, two caricatures, if you like, two pictures that we can hold up against ourselves and say, is this me? But he's less concerned with the colour of their eyes or their haircut or how they dress. He's more concerned with their character. So, Portrait 1, verse 19, the rich man, very rich in fact, if life is about possessions and this guy has made it, he dresses in purple, cloth dyed with an ex exceptionally expensive dye, and not just any cloth, but fine linen, none of your scratchy cotton here, he lives in luxury, not the occasional treat, but luxury every day. And he lives in a gated property. We know that because portrait two, our second caricature, lives just outside the gate. All this man possesses is his name, Lazarus. Not the Lazarus he gets raised from the dead, the historical Lazarus uh, later on. That's around about Luke 19. We're in Luke chapter 16 at the moment. But rather this is a fictional character for the sakes of this parable called Lazarus. Now notice that Lazarus doesn't lie down himself. He is laid down as though he can't even move under his own steam. And perhaps that's why he was a beggar, because he has no way to make a living. He isn't able to. We're not told, but perhaps. Nevertheless, there's no sense of blame here. It's just how it is. Lazarus is laid at the gate of the rich man, covered in sores and far from well fed. In fact, hunger has taken such a hold that he'd be thrilled just to be given the food swept up off the floor after it's fallen off the tables of the rich man. Though he longed for it, he wasn't given it. 
Instead, there he was, laid at the gates of the rich man, hungry and going without even scraps. He never asks for pity, but even the stray dogs on the street can sense his plight and they lick his sores. And so we have our characters, our portraits, the rich man and Lazarus. And when we read between the lines, we quickly see that Lazarus's plight is entirely unnecessary. He's at the gates of the rich man. The rich man need barely reach out to lift this man out of suffering. And yet he hasn't. If these are portraits of how life is in the world today, in this life, then the following verses describe what comes next, that is, life after death. Given Lazarus's plight, perhaps it isn't a great surprise to hear in verse 22 that the time came when the beggar died. I take it that the angels carried him to Abraham's side is simply saying that he is welcomed into eternity with God where Abraham is. We heard before that all Lazarus had was his name, but now he's inherited the kingdom of heaven. He did nothing to earn it. Indeed, when he dies, he's carried, verse 22, he doesn't walk to heaven. Yet clearly in the midst of his situation, he had a living faith in God. And there he is by the grace of God. But what about the rich man? Well, they say that death comes to us all. And so whether it's a day later or perhaps a decade, the rich man, verse 22, also died and was buried. Ah, spot the difference? No angels, no Abraham, no eternity in the kingdom of heaven. Quite the opposite. Verse 23 tells us he's in Hades in torment in hell. He's suffering the consequences of missing out on eternity with God. What went wrong? Well, that's the point of this parable. It's asking, what was it about the rich man that caused him to end up in hell? And what was it about Lazarus that led him to heaven? And how can we make sure that we don't end up in hell but in heaven. Well, we've seen that the rich man did nothing to meet Lazarus's needs. So is that it? If the rich man had met Lazarus's needs, would he have ended up in heaven? Is this parable saying, if I give money to the poor, then I'll get into heaven? Well, no, salvation is not won by work. And when we read the parable carefully, we pretty quickly see that that isn't what the parable is saying either. Jesus doesn't end this parable by saying, so give your money to the poor. He ends it with Abraham and the rich man having a conversation about repentance. The rich man arrives in hell and for the purposes of storytelling in this parable, he's able to speak to Abraham in heaven and he's used to getting his own way and used to negotiating things in his favour. So he takes up with Abraham and says, look, just send Lazarus over to give me some water. I'm parched. Well, if he was convinced that he'd be able to manipulate his circumstances in hell, he's in for a shock because the answer comes back in two parts. And the first part is that he needs to repent. What makes you think Lazarus should be serving you, says Abraham. You had everything in the last life and he had nothing. And you didn't let one of your servants lift a finger to help him. And now you want him to come running for you? No, you received your good things and kept them all for yourself in the last life. Now Lazarus has good things. Why should he not keep them for himself? The rich man's activity for others does not match up with his expectations of others. It's a sinful hypocrisy and Abraham calls him out on it. The implication is that he needed to repent, to turn back, to ask God forgiveness for his sinfulness. But the next thing that Abraham says is a hammer blow. Abraham says, look, 
even if you repented, you've already died. So actually, it's too late. There's a chasm between heaven and hell that cannot be bridged. There's no way to go from one to the other. Now, that is simultaneously glorious and terrible news. And it depends entirely on where you're standing when you hear it. If you're in hell, that is terrible news. There's no escape whatsoever. The torment will never end. There is nothing that you can do about it. If you're in heaven, that's amazing news. Because nothing can take you from heaven. You need never fear the future because it is precisely what God promised. An eternity enjoying him and all his blessings with nothing to threaten it. Well, the rich man is taking this in and now as understanding dawns, he shows that you don't have to be a monster to miss out on heaven. In fact, you can be a perfectly normal person. We know this because the rich man shows next that he cares about his family. Those that he left behind when he died, he cares enough to beg Abraham on their behalf. I'm lost, he says. I missed the boat for salvation, but while they're still alive, they can still be saved. Verse 27. Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. All it will take, he reasons, is a sharp shock, something that will wake them up, help them realise that they've slipped into a spiritual lethargy, a dangerous spiritual coma, if you like, oblivious to the danger that faces them. But what shock would do this? Well, a resurrected man appearing before them to tell them what the problem is. Surely that would do the trick, wouldn't it? Abraham pushes back. Don't they have their Old Testament? Don't they have the word of God right there in front of them? After all, this rich man refers to Abraham as Father Abraham. So they clearly claim Judaism as their faith. This rich man and his brothers have been in synagogues or even the temple throughout their lives, hearing the words of God, taking in the law and the prophets. It's all there. Everything you need to know about believing in God, about putting your faith in him, is entirely there. Abraham would know his faith was credited to him as righteousness, and his faith journey is all recorded in the Old Testament. Abraham's answer, to put it bluntly, is this. Guys, if you're looking for a miracle, then stop it and pick up a Bible instead. You're in England. You have the greatest breadth and choice of translations of any language in the world and the easiest access to them. Even lockdown can't keep you from a Bible. If you can't afford it, let me know. I cannot think of a Christian brother or sister who wouldn't gladly give you one. If you can't read very well, it's available in audio on MP3 online, even parts of it as a graphic novel. There is no excuse for not accessing the word of God. And ultimately, there's no excuse for not accepting what's contained in it. What would it take to convince you or me of the reality of God? If your answer to that question is that you're waiting for something spectacular to happen, waiting for something to sweep you off your feet, waiting for someone to rise from the dead, then you need to hear Abraham's words. You see, the rich man says to him, well, if someone from the dead goes to them, then they'll repent. But Abraham replies, no, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, that is the scriptures, they won't be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Because the reality is that such scepticism isn't just for scepticism's sake. It's rooted in a desire to deny the truth. And that kind of scepticism skepticism won't ever be persuaded away by flashy signs and miracles. Such scepticism won't even be persuaded by the historical fact that Christ rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. No fact will ever win the day. 
Instead, that kind of spiritual darkness and skepticism, it can only be swept aside by getting to know the one who rose himself. A personal relationship with Christ Jesus. And you can only really get to know Christ Jesus by reading, listening to, accepting, absorbing his word, the Holy Bible. The warning this parable leaves us with is this then. There is a time coming, and none of us knows when, when Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead. Some of us, perhaps all of us, will die before that day. But when that time comes, the time for repentance will be over. We will either join with Christ forever or be consigned to hell. And there will be no movement between those two places. So you need to decide. Now, if it were in my power, I would convince each and every person who hears this message that you ought to place your faith entirely in Christ Jesus right now. My eager desire for you is that you would know you were saved without any shadow of a doubt and that you would spend every day of the rest of your lives living with the joyful assurance that no matter what else happens, you are surely destined for heaven. But I can't make that decision for you. You must make it for yourself. But I do leave you with this challenge. If you're waiting for the spectacular experience or sign that will finally convince you that Christ is worth following you, then you are in mortal danger. Because Christ has already died and risen. And you're ignoring the testimony of scripture which says it doesn't matter how spectacular you may find what Jesus did, he died for you to save you from your sins. So you are called to the obedience of faith in him as your Lord and Master. Brothers and sisters, don't wait. Read the Gospels. Make sure you've placed your faith in Christ as your Lord and Saviour today. There can be no more urgent task. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that we have your Holy Bible, we have your scriptures, and unlike those who stood around Jesus on that day, we have the New Testament as well, the whole of the Holy Scriptures that we can read and understand and, and just take time to absorb this testimony of your life and your teaching. Lord, in it we find this call to faith for the salvation of sins. Lord, we pray that you would help us not to make excuses for why we don't believe, but rather to commit to you, to place our faith in you, to follow you as our Lord and Master. Lord, grant this, we pray, by your Holy Spirit, cut through the scepticism in our hearts, and may we, uh, may we deepen in our knowledge of you, our relationship with you, and may we follow you as disciples that glorify you. Uh, as we submit to you for your glory. Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, uh, if you found this message helpful, I would encourage you to uh, like and subscribe on our YouTube channel, and that helps us to get this message to others. Uh, and uh, I'd encourage you just to mull over these things. If you're lacking in assurance, if you're doubting, if you're just not sure how you feel about these things, let me encourage you to pray to God about it. You don't have to have the perfect words. God already knows your heart, as we heard in our passage last week. But let me encourage you just to place that before God and to ask him to just grant you that conviction of who he is and what he's done, that you would know assurance in Jesus' name. We pray that you grow in your faith this week and find great joy in knowing just how loved you are by Jesus Christ. May God bless you.